virtuality in the Deleuzian sense of the virtual, which is the not yet material. Architecture is all, has been colonizing that field and has been thinking about it. Most of what I'll show you will be virtual. It's a virtual space which is pointed towards construction and building, which is very different than what everyone here is concerned with. But the principles apply nonetheless to all kinds of different mediums. So the medium I'm in is architecture. I often work with people in other mediums, and I think architecture is really good at connecting other mediums up. But um, I just thought I would quickly show you a couple images. This is an image of my office. Um, the kind of key employee is this very large robot, uh, which we use for building all of our models. We use it for building furniture. We use it for building uh, tests of construction elements. But one of the things that is maybe unique about the way I work and it's becoming more common slowly is that instead of designing a virtual document and giving it to someone to realize, what we'll do is design a virtual document that gets sent to a machine. And so we're talking to machines now instead of talking to builders. And I think that's a significant shift you see in the entire field of architecture. It's just um, we're doing that translation ourselves in the office. Um, and it, you know, these elements go to scale. Of, I mean, this is all done in my office. They go to the scale of interiors you can build. But in Southern California especially, and I'll show you some examples, there are industries like car prototypers, uh, military um, industries, the entertainment industry, where they're building things bigger than buildings using exactly the same technology. And I'm very connected to those industries where we can take a file in a very digital pipeline and direct it right to a robot to manufacture. And that was the, the kind of first ideas about this embryological house came from that desire. The principles are fairly simple across the board. You take a geometry like this, which is defined by calculus base curves. You translate that geometry into the path of a tool. And that tool has certain information built into it like the size of the material and the steps. You then take that tool path and translate it against a material, virtually, like this. And then eventually you send this code to the machine to manufacture the components. So this is an approach that, that I use in a mixture. We could talk about this maybe more tomorrow, how classic artisanal work gets integrated with this kind of high-tech approach. But what, what this approach means is that because I'm talking to machines most of the time, the machines don't care if, say, one construction element is identical to the other. Because it's a machine I'm talking to. And it's very sophisticated in terms of shape and geometry. So architecture is a field where, unlike industrial design, where you're sometimes dealing with a material, like a one material, one shape object, like a cup, in architecture, you're putting tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of parts into an assembly, and the parts get attention as details, and the assembly gets attention as a whole. So in architecture, you have to think about the relationship of a part to a whole, and it's not as simple anymore as saying, well, the parts are all repetitive modules, and the whole is the collection of that repetition. Instead, you can start to think that the part of the whole are in a more in an algorithmic communication, a calculus based uh, holism of infinitesimal dimension. There are all kinds of ways about thinking about the relation of part to whole. But in architecture, I think very fortuitously, we have to maintain the idea of a whole. That a building has a discrete set of limits, and that we have to maintain that discrete set of limits as a building. It puts a different kind of uh, bias on our field. But this whole relationship of part to whole is why uh, I look to, to 
a, gr a whole group of philosophers, but Leibniz in particular, because he was the most sophisticated about thinking about part-to-whole relationships in terms of his monadology. So, the things that I'll show you tonight, um, I would lump under the idea of the primitive. Primitive not meaning uh, like a primitive culture, but the primitive being uh, a starting point which is not an origin. And again, we'll talk about this tomorrow morning, but the architecture's belief in origins, like that you would have an ideal cube, and that if you built a building based on an ideal cube, the people that would visit the building would experience the ideality of the cube, is one of the oldest ideas in our field. Uh, for me, I think of a primitive, which is something which is virtual. Unlike the cube, which is infinite, it's the same for everybody, and you stay it once and for all. A primitive is something which is poised uh, at being complete. It's not already completed at the beginning. So it has yet to be unfolded, and it has yet to be defined. And with all of these projects, they start with some notion of a primitive, which isn't ideal. Um, the geometric principle for this is calculus. I won't bore you with the description of calculus, but the big idea in calculus is that instead of privileging whole numbers, like three, five, seven, nine, in the history of architecture there was a debate for almost a thousand years about whether architecture was better divided into sevenths or ninths. Ninths being the scale of your head to your body, sevenths being the scale of your nose to your head. So there were all kinds of debates about which whole number ratios were better. And it's because until the 16th century, is Mario's argument, Carpo's argument, there was no digital. Everything was a fraction. So you would take one seventh, and you would take a fifth of a seventh, and you'd take a ninth of a fifth of a seventh, and you would always divide everything by subdivision of fractions. So whole numbers became symbolic and sacred, mostly out of expediency. So it was too difficult to think of anything but whole numbers. Um, calculus replaces the value of the whole number and replaces the zero, zero with the concept of the infinitesimal, which is that you can take a curve, and you can subdivide that curve infinitely into smaller and smaller and smaller line segments, and each of those line segments is defined in relation to all of the other line segments. So instead of having a fixed unit against which you calculate a sum, you have a continuous equation where the components of the equation are calculated continuously with the entire equation. So it's a continuous mathematics rather than a discrete mathematics. It's good for calculating objects that move. It's good for calculating trajectories. Anything that involves motion, calculus can describe in a way that a discrete mathematical system can. Now, buildings don't move, or they move so slowly you don't perceive them. But the idea of the part and whole that comes out of calculus was a thing that interested, interested me. And the loss of the module, the loss of sacred geometry, uh, the loss of the ideal form is, for me, an opportunity to think a new theoretical model. So 10 years ago, uh, a lot of architects were making messes because all of these things were suddenly lost and they had computers on their desks and they didn't need these things anymore. Now is the time in architecture where people are theorizing a new set of principles. And more and more I'm going back to classical problems of part to whole, of ornament to structure, all these issues and thinking them through with this new set of intellectual tools and with a new set of machines and ways of building things. Okay, so all of these categories come out of this new thinking about the relation of a part to a whole and a dimensional series which is continuous.